Um, hello, everybody. Um, so I'm, I'm Don Vice, Head of Planning at Zach. Um, we've got a really uh, cultured and audience first kind of panel for you here. Uh, so we've got Jack Fryer, uh, who heads up uh, strategy and uh, audience research and planning at Universal Music. Uh, Matt, uh, who's CCO at Zach with me. Uh, Paul Simmons works at Vice, um, doing various sort of cultural things across the luxury world. Um, we've got Alison Keep from Coty, uh, leading media for a variety of brands, including Gucci and Rimmel and, and, and many more. Uh, and then Stephen Lacey, uh, who heads up uh, his own practice, uh, doing kind of lots of cultural insights uh, and runs the, uh, the Cultural Insight Forum as well, which is, which is well worth uh, a look if you get a chance. Um, so uh, this whole thing has all come out of a study we've done uh, called Selfhood. Um, and, and, and this piece um, looks at the self and the hood. Uh, so the self is who you are, um, you know, how you think, how you feel, and we've kind of approached that from a neuroscience point of view. And then the hood uh, is the, uh, the environment that you're in, so the culture that you experience, the people that you meet, um, and, and everything that's around you. And, and we kind of put those two things together to create a point of view on, on youth audiences and, and youth brands. Um, so it's our uh, global network. It's under 30s predominantly. Um, tends to be quite early adopter types. Tends to be quite innovative, creative people. Um, and then we also have this sort of neuroscience lens as well. So we have psychologists and neuroscientists uh, who we kind of bring into our creative process to uh, to start to kind of uh, make sure we are kind of grounding in, in, in more rigor than, than purely uh, kind of cultural insight. Um, and now. now this piece has looked at what we call the social brain. Um, so around 16 to 24 years old, when you start to kind of move from being a child and into being an adult, uh, kind of adolescence, um, the bits of the brain which start to uh, develop are called the social brain. Uh, so you start to understand a bit more about who you are, a bit more about how other people view you, um, and you start to kind of become a little bit more self-aware of, of, of kind of your place in the world. Um, quote here from uh, Sarah Jane Blakemore, who's the kind of the foremost neuroscientist uh, in this field. Um, so this helps recognize others and evaluate their mental states, intentions, desires, uh, and beliefs, feelings, enduring dispositions, and actions. Okay? So uh, essentially what you're trying to do is understand how other people view you. Um, now critically for this, um, at this point your personal brand is born. So you start to actually start to think about how you come across to other people. Um, and you start to curate how you come across to other people. Um, uh, the way that brands play a role within that um, is to act as conduits to that identity. Uh, so they are giving you the tools to start to build up an idea of, of who you are. Um, uh, again, when we're thinking about this from a, a neuroscience point of view, um, this period of transition uh, for these kind of kids uh, is sort of deemed what they call sensitive. Um, now, you know, teenagers tend to be you know, a bit grumpy and a bit moody, and it's easy to kind of see themselves as being, you know, all those things. But actually, it's because there is huge amounts of development going on in their brain, um, which creates huge amounts of pressure. Um, now, the key element of that pressure uh, is peer pressure. Okay, uh, so adolescents tend to take three times as many risks when they're around their friends. Um, which is very critical uh, in this age um, because they're always around their friends. Uh, they're not dipping in and dipping out of those, uh, of those relationships. They're not going to school and leaving school, seeing mates and leaving mates. Um, they are constantly connected through social media. So this idea of peer pressure becomes something which is ever pervasive uh, for this audience. Um, so you start to build up a very different backdrop uh, of how these audiences are forming their identity. Uh, so it's always on social media, always on peer pressure, uh, and therefore always on identity. Um, and, and it's this backdrop which we've explored with our piece, um, and which we're going to kick up things off today. Um, so, so one of the trends that we've identified is this idea of burning down the house. Um, now, now, burning down the house is, is sort of built around the idea of rebellion. Uh, so, uh, w which isn't necessarily a, a new thing for these audiences, but it's new in the way that they can express themselves. Um, so they're looking at older generations, uh, looking out into the world and, and thinking that actually look, they don't really seem to, to meet my value systems. They don't have the same views politically as me. They don't have the same views on the environment as me. They don't have the same views as gender on me. Um, and, 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 and what's creating here is a division between 
what they see as older generations and, 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 and what they're thinking and believing. Um, uh, and, and, and I think critically, instead of just kind of getting on with their lives and kind of carrying on with the world and, and sort of getting a job like other kind of previous rebellious generations have done, um, these guys are liberated by technology. Uh, so they're able to actually be scaled in their rebellion and sustained in their rebellion. So things like the Me Too movement um, aren't just them kind of going, I'm going to do this and then I'm going to leave it and I'm going to kind of get my normal job. Uh, actually, it's, 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 it's a way for them to actually change the world. And they're leaning into brands who, who also want to share those values and change the world with them as well. Um, so Adidas Parlay, for example, is, 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 is a great one to do that. Um, so brands which kind of share that sense of purpose and share those values of brand, are brands that they're leaning into. Um, and, and, and if they are encountering people and brands that don't lean into their views, then they are retreating away from that. So you're starting to see them pulling away from Facebook and into their own kind of smaller, more like-minded communities like Depop um, and like the Supreme Q and, and, and like Twitch and for, for gaming as well. Um, so so it, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting uh, kind of generation and, and they're experiencing uh, rebellion in, in, a, in a whole new way which is way more stained and, 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 uh, and way more sustainable for them. Um, so that, that's a bit of an overview of, of a point of view uh, on on audiences, particularly around this age group. Um, but I, I kind of want to open it up to the panel now. Um, oh, actually, sorry, we've got a video to show first. The way that everybody thinks you're not unique, you are replaceable. Young people now are united in an understanding that their voice is important. This age group have always been at the heart of kind of rebellion. The difference now, I guess, is tech and connectivity. I feel like on my generation, we have to be up to date on what everything is happening. They're not confined by the rules that are already in existence. They're looking to actually kind of change society. These young people have immediate access to all this kind of information, but from their peer group and by people they trust. That's so powerful. <laughs> If the brand doesn't have good values, I'm not going to shop there. It isn't something that they're just going to grow out of as they get older. It's something quite core to their belief system. Look how fast the movement around single-use plastic has caught fire. Um, and that is down to kind of technology and connectivity and people at the heart of that idea wanting to make a real change for the better. Feminism, people turning vegetarian, people turning vegan, how we interact with the world that we live in. I think that that's something that is kind of like it's going to be the duty of our generation. That's also being driven by really proactive brands. You look at Adidas and their use of Parley in football kits. It's real significant moves that are lining up to a generation of people that are making significant changes. When people like mods and rockers used to rebel, they used to wear like safety pins, as if that's anything. Rebellion has turned into activism. Having that kind of capacity to be close to something that you're not exactly close to is something amazing. It's not just a reaction to what's gone before. Now, if something piques their interest, then they can actually do something about it. Cool. So, um, that's a bit of an overview um, of, of, that, of one of the trends which has come out of that report. Um, but I, I kind of want to open up to the panel now um, and, and really just ask the question, um, you know, how are youth audiences changing today and, and, and how do brands kind of, kind of deal with that? Um, I don't know if, Stephen, you want to start us off. Okay. So, I, I think in, in some ways, if we, youth is definitely changing, but if we look at the fundamental drives of youth, which are like having fun, fame on a kind of localised level, so being good at something, being good at DJ, being funny, being good at football, sense of kind of freedom, they kind of remain in the same place. But I think what's really interesting is this tension between hope and fear. So young people still have hope, and, but hope in a way has become more complicated. So who do I emulate? What kind of person do I want to be? It used to be simple. So if you was a man, you'd want to be a strong alpha male, with lots of muscles and kind of well-built, like a Spartan, never really achieved it kind of myself. Now that pathway of success has suddenly kind of broadened out. So a young male can kind of be a Renaissance man, like Russell kind of brand. He can be a multi-millionaire kind of businessman, like Alan Sugar. He can be a geek who's a kind of billionaire. He can be a sportsman. He can be the Spartan. He can be many different things. So the roadmap's opened up, which is a good thing, but it also creates confusion. The other essence of, in terms of hopes, 
I, I used to say that dreams are dead. And I think the young people are probably one of the only audiences that are actually really kind of dreaming again. And they have dreams, but those dreams are coming less and less kind of accessible. So you kind of got this kind of hopes that can't be kind of achieved, or I don't know where I want to go, and constant kind of fear. And some people say we're in a position of kind of stormsy kind of Britain. It's kind of quite dark, and it's hard, hard for young people. So you have these dreams, but how do I achieve these dreams? And it'd probably be kind of impossible to kind of achieve. So this tension of hope and fear is kind of taking place. And then you kind of look at the internet. And what, what's interesting about the internet, and the internet has a lot of benefits, but I call it the kind of Icarus effect. And Icarus, for those, is kind of the person who thought he was a god, flew to the sun and kind of burnt down. So when you're on the internet, people think they're gods. You reach up for the sun, you have the perfect picture, the perfect image, the most friends. Then you look at your friend's profile and they have better likes and better kind of images than you. So you crash down. So this constant kind of oscillation between success on one side and failure on the other. The good thing about that is people are going on the journey between success and, and failure. When people are in the kind of mode of success, they're going out of directed and they're also tapping into their super ego, how I show the world who I am and my success. When they crash, they're going inward directed, kind of questioning who they are and also looking at, into the place of the kind of ego. So you have this kind of tension that's going on between success and kind of failure. Because of the, this kind of whirlwind of success and failure, people are starting to question who they are. So they start saying, what are my values? And once you determine your values, they're valuables, values that are really kind of un unmovable and essentially can't be moved. The other thing is, when you fail, you start to learn what your vulnerabilities are. And vulnerabilities is authenticity. Everyone talks about authenticity, authenticity. It's kind of a bit of a swear word, and it's a bit annoying, really, in the context of kind of marketing. But authenticity is showing your vulnerable side. It's showing the complete side of who you are. And, cons and young people are reaching out. They want brands that show realness and kind of truthfulness. Another big trend that I'm kind of seeing is this conflict, not conflict, but the shift from the I to the we. So we've always been an individualistic kind of, kind of nation, and the I still exists. Entrepreneurial culture, I want to show my kind of super ego. I, I, I want to kind of be kind of successful. But we're starting to see this emergence of collectivism and also this emergence of the kind of we. So people are going to become much more political kind of activists. In the United States, young people, I think YouGov said 43% would prefer socialism over kind of capitalism. So we're seeing this kind of protest movement and this sense of community. So we're getting to this place of kind of collective kind of individualism. The other area is trust. And I think trust is interesting. So I used to say there's a trust vacuum. Apart from vice, people don't really kind of trust the media. They don't trust the government. They don't trust the local institutions, don't trust the kind of government. So what's happening is trust is people don't trust things above them. They're not trusting government, they're not trusting kind of experts. But what they're doing is they're trusting people kind of sideways. And they're trusting peers. But what's even more interesting is actually people will trust a stranger who comes to your house on Airbnb probably more than the conservative government. And the last, the last kind of element really is one of kind of self kind of fulfillment and this idea of self salvation which the, is an american kind of term but this is this idea that young people want to look at the rules and rip them up and start again wow uh, loads of really interesting stuff there stephen um i, I interested in the idea of trust uh, so people aren't looking up they're looking more at a level um jack i i, I wonder how that plays out uh, in the world of music um, you know, traditionally, uh, you know, an industry which builds up idols uh, at the top. Yeah, I mean, I, first of all, thank you. That was an amazing start. It's quite difficult to follow, if I'm <laughs> especially when you're as cold as I am. I feel like Britney Spears playing her final gig in Moscow <laughs> in the Arctic Circle. Um, trust. Yeah, I think the shift that I've really noticed, even just going out there and doing focus groups, is the default setting of young people when confronted with a new idea or a new proposal or proposition is, I don't believe you. I, I, I think it's impossible to overstate the extent to which this generation is aggressively cynical and disbelieving of the machinery of marketing and the machinery of image production. 
And I, I, I wonder how much of that owes to the fact that in a world of Instagram and Facebook and social networks, the machinery of image production and the creation of brand imagery or strategic communication is now in their hands. I, I, I know it's a kind of a slightly passe thing to say, but it's never been truer to say the consumer is dead. You do focus groups, they don't go like they used to. They don't go like they used to because the, 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 the kids don't feel like consumers anymore. Of course they're not. If anything, they feel like they're giving me marketing consultancy. <laughs> they're advising me and the pop stars I try to represent advice on how we might tweak the Pantone on the third Instagram shot or how our Snapchat stories aren't optimised for the platform. And if I could just leave one message, I think it would be that. And, and, and that is the story of a, a more cynical, a more informed generation uh, than ever before. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think that's fascinating because I, I think it, it, it shows how, uh, how keen they are to actually really understand how brands are working, um, which I think puts a spotlight on maybe older brands who are trying to sort of play in this space. Um, and it makes it incredibly difficult. Um, you know, I think, Steve, you, you touched on, you know, the, the idea of authenticity as part of this. Um, and, and, you know, I think you, as a brand, you have to stay true to yourself as well. Um, and, and I think it, it's, it's very difficult if traditionally maybe you're hitting an older demographic with your, you know, with, 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 your, with your products and your services, um, and you're trying to age down, because uh, inherently people are cynical um, and they are distrusting of, of, of that kind of that marketing machinery, which they are, uh, you know, which they can see very, very clearly. Um, I, I, Ali, I, I, I wonder whether um, your experience at uh, Coty might uh, <laughs> shed some light on that. We have a lot of brands that are over 100 years old. So Max Factor, for example, he invented the word, sorry, he invented the word makeup. So you kind of go, we should have the right to play in that space. But when you're, that heritage can sometimes be a huge burden when you're talking to an audience that doesn't believe you anymore. And heritage doesn't necessarily mean that, that you have the right to still play. Uh, so we spend an enormous amount of time, I guess, really trying to understand how you can play in that space. I agree with you, I don't like the word authentic, but how can you be real to them? And you can give the same product to a hundred different consumers and they will all use it completely differently. Everyone applies eyeliner differently. Men apply fragrance differently. You know, no one is the same as each other. And I think what we're truly, really trying to embrace is that difference. It's not about having the same look as a celebrity. It's about having thousands and thousands of different ways that people can engage with your brand, with your products, and use it in a way that feels real to them, rather than us trying to tell them, this is what you must look like. You must look like Kate Moss. You must look like Cara Delevingne. <clears throat> so we're increasingly working less with celebrities and, and major influencers, and more with micro-influencers, people who maybe have three or four hundred followers or five hundred followers, but they're really passionate about the category or themselves or um, not necessarily our brand. We don't mind if they use our brand in combination with loads and loads of other brands, as long as they're using it in a way that feels like a good way for them. And it's very, very difficult as marketers, especially when it's a physical product, to stop telling people what to do in this audience and go, you must apply mascara like this. Why? Do it how you like. It's your stuff. You've bought it. Um, but it's not a natural place for marketers to be in where they, they, they want us to uh, necessarily conform. So I think releasing that kind of freedom back to the consumer to be whoever they want to be in the space, and especially a space like beauty where you have to be even more careful to not impose and be unrealistic in, in standards or in behavior. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it, it feels like there's a, a real shift um, away from a sense of tribalism and, and belonging to one thing and, and then ascribing to that in a singular sense um, and, and actually kind of being uh, way more kind of explorative, I think, in, in, in how you bring in your cultural sources to kind of, uh, to kind of forge your own identity. And I think that comes through in some of the stuff that you're saying. Um, how about you, Paul? From your experience at, at Vice and in fashion, how, how does that come across? Um, do I need a mic or am I okay? Yeah, you're okay. Good. Um, it, it's, it's really interesting hearing the different perspectives because there's, there's a lot of cross up like the cynicism, um, the sort of individuality. I think for me, I think one word that's really key is control. There's a real desire to 
have a layer of control, you know, there's, there's this trust in um, the establishment and, and structures around um, these, these consumers to, to look after them in, in any shape or form, and they can only do it themselves. And that could range from, you know, fashion entrepreneurs on uh, Depop. I mean, the, if you, I think I can't remember what the number was, but something like over 80% of the teenagers in the US who have part-time jobs wouldn't be termed as typical, traditional teenage part-time jobs, working in a shop, whatever. These guys are really good at turning their, their passions and their interests into business. And I think whether it be stuff like that or decreasing the amount of alcohol they drink, there's a real feeling that they have to take control of their own world because no one else is going to do it for them. Now, from a, from a fashion lens, it's interesting, much with you know, music and beauty, fashion is very much at the, the forefront, in the, in the front line in terms of identity, um, but also at the same time, serial offenders of getting it wrong. So I think... You know, it's always a concern when a big brand, whether it be fashion or anywhere, gets, gets a sniff of a new sort of issue or topic and they see it as a concept for a campaign. And I think, um, as Jack said, the sort of the bullshit uh, sense of these guys is really hot. So if you, you know, if you have diversity in your, your beauty campaign, but then your catwalk campaign doesn't communicate the same thing, you'll get called on it. Yeah. You know you can't smoke mirrors at anymore. These guys will research and you know, pull you apart. And, and rightly so, to be honest, because if you yeah. are going to be talking about purpose, if you are going to you know, position yourself as contributing to social change or social conversation, you need to live it. Yeah. Um, and I think within fashion, I think there's been as many sort of failures, uh, if not more, than success stories of brands doing that in a, in a, in a way that really connects. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it almost makes it quite risky for brands in many ways, isn't it? Because they, they do have such keen bullshit detectors, as, as, as you said. I think you, you really have to be very clear about what it is that you do and, and, and really follow through with that in, in, in all those kind of different touch points. Um, but I also wanted to touch on your idea of control. Um, you know, like traditionally, brands tend to be kind of quite top down. You know, you define what you are and then you kind of push that message out to consumers. Um, but from what you know, a number of you guys are saying that it, it feels like that's kind of being inverted a little bit. Um, and, and actually, brands need to kind of let go a little bit and, and actually let consumers kind of kind of do some of the work and, and, and build up some of those values. Um, kind of, I'll open it up to everybody. Is it, how do you guys feel about that as a as a sort of paradigm shift for brands? I think that's like that's like throwing a grenade into the last <laughs> hundred <laughs> years of marketing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love it. Um, I think you know brands have been built in a certain way for a long time about a set of values and models and brand keys and what's our brand essence and all the rest of it and I think you're now looking at an audience that wants to participate to build their own identity using using that brand as a as a tool rather than as a badge and I think the the sort of the binary nature between success and failure that that uh, that, that Steve was talking about is is the way they learn right so a brand needs to kind of walk alongside them and help them learn. But I, I don't know, I think to, to do that in, in an audience where everyone thinks they're a, a marketeer, everyone thinks they're a creative, you know, everyone wants their own say on how they apply their makeup, maybe it means that the whole way that we build and market brands needs to be reassessed and restructured. Maybe, maybe brands can be as fluid as our consumers. Maybe the idea of, you know, Jack Daniels uh, representing kind of Mr. Jack and, and this, this sort of, you know, small gathering that you see when you walk into Oxford Circus every day for the last 25 years. Maybe that's, that's time for, for change. Maybe that's why it's in a long, slow decline. Maybe no one cares about 100 years of making it the same way. Maybe everyone can see through the fact that it isn't eight people in a small distillery. Maybe it's, you know, a thousand people in an enormous distillery and we're just using smoke and mirrors to tell them about that. So. If brands can maybe adopt a more fluid approach to how they communicate and move from campaigns to like long-term participatory events, then you're giving your consumer something. Yeah, nice. Um, I, think, I think the flip side to that is, you know, if you, if you take this kind of brand as chameleon or brand as like hyper-agile sort of plasticine model, I, I sort of like the idea of it, it connects with a wider discussion about open branding, which is a popular conversation in conferences like this, the flip side is, I genuinely believe that this cohort is still looking for meaning. 
And I think that's where the purpose, you know, purpose is the buzzword of today. Really, it's about meaning and it's about why. Yeah. And it's about standing for something. And that's a much more, it's a definition of authenticity that I'm much more comfortable with. Because authenticity is this very slippery, elusive word that can mean different things, different circumstances, different people. But I do believe in brand meaning. So I think perhaps there's a trade-off that okay, we stand for something, but we have agility. And we can pivot when we need to. I think when you try and apply that meaning to two different cohorts, so 40-year-old consumer and the same set of values are trying to work for an 18-year-old consumer, that's where it, it, it doesn't necessarily work for me. That's where you see things like Voxy and Gifgaf have done really well because they're breaking away from the master brands and doing something that's very tightly targeted. And, uh, and I think we'll see more of that. I think some of the bigger brands will kind of go, I'm, I'm giving up on this audience and, and the company, the holding company, will create something more specific. Stephen, you got something to add to that? I, I think one of the things I'm seeing is that because people want realness, and you see realness through kind of culture, and you look through a kind of cultural lens. So when you kind of look at like HBO, or you look at kind of Daredevils, or you look at film, you don't get good and evil characters anymore. You get something more complicated, something more in the middle. So what people are kind of recognizing in that quest for realness is they don't like perfection. So I think when brands are saying, I'm perfect, or it's a brand talking at them, saying how good they are, they kind of, they get very much kind of shut down. And I think, I think you need to move away about that. I think brands need to ultimately, in some ways, kind of stand for something. So when I've done kind of social purpose work or kind of looked in diversity space, we always look for what does the brand kind of stand for? What's the brand personality? Then we look at what spaces they can occupy. So I looked through the whole of Mars for diversity, whole of Mars brands, and we took every brand. And we start, our start point was, OK, the Mars bar. If Mars bar was a person, what kind of person is he? Well, he's a cheeky chap, he reads the sun, he's a working class guy. OK, where, where do we match that? What men's suicide? So Galaxy, sophisticated, elegant brand. Where do we take that in the diversity space? We show people from different ethnic minorities that are sophisticated and elegant. And I think that's the start point, because then it kind of sense, you get that sense of real. The only defense of advertising I will make, but I will also give it a kick in, is that I think advertising has lost its light. Advertising used to be really, really powerful. Advertising used to be the light that kind of led kind of change. It's now rear view mirror. So in the diversity space, it's not advertising agencies that are saying, let's do diverse campaigns. It's a client telling them to do that. And that, for me, is kind of fundamentally kind of wrong. And there's a problem there. Um, um, I think there's also something around what we mentioned on sort of self-actualization. And you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of great articles about how the Maslow hierarchy of needs is no longer relevant because you get sort of 18 year olds come out of university wanting that purpose, whether that be cause related or, or, or something. And I think, you know, it's, it's no surprise that when you've got things like influencers growing as a, as a, as a you know, as an industry, it's because this audience are looking for brands to mirror to them what they see in themselves or what they want to see them in themselves. And if you can do that with a human face, mm -hmm. It's far more powerful. So, you know, if you're human, if you're vulnerable, if you admit to your mistakes and you have that sort of human dialogue, um, yeah, there may be a shitstorm initially, but you will get, you'll be able to navigate far better because you are mirroring the sort of experience that this audience is having. Um, and I, I think what, where, where brands sometimes go wrong, if it is something around that's more altruistic, more sort of cause related, would be diversity or something. They, they too often co-op something. Mm. You know, if you see a, a groundswell where there's, say, like a local collective, so, so okay, so with the same diversity, there's a fantastic um, female collective called Geldem who focus on getting women of colour into, into media. So rather than being putting your brand and product in front of that groundswell, acting as a platform to amplify that message, that, that's far more of a you know, genuine way to actually contribute to a social conversation as opposed to co-opting something as a concept. So I, I really think, the, you know, these guys have grown up on Facebook or Instagram or whatever, they've, they've, they, they understand branding to a degree, and yes, maybe not the same way that we like think we do, but they see themselves as brands, they have their real life conversations on WhatsApp, but the, you know, the shiny version of themselves trying to get the likes on social media, they have their shop on Depop, 
you know, they, they see themselves on a par with these brands that they're trying to align themselves with. Um, and therefore, I think that the brands need to mirror as much of that back as possible so that, uh, that it is a genuine connection there. So yeah. that's, that's interesting. So the difference is between co-opting, and that's just like bor borrowing the theme, yeah. versus genuinely contributing. Yeah, so in two forms, either you, are you acting as the platform mm. for that ground source, so you're actually magnifying it, or is it something that is core to your business that actually, you know, it's not just diversity in our, our campaign, it's every layer yeah. within our company, because mm. it's something that we truly believe in. So it's, I just think it needs to have that, that honesty either yeah. way. And that comes back to meaning, like what yeah. is the brand's North Star? And how is that North Star manifesting absolutely every strategic decision the brand appears to make? For example, I don't know, a brand like Patagonia, for example, I, I struggle to find somebody from Gen Z uh, who has a bad word to say about a brand like that because it seems so holistic yeah. as an approach and therefore it seems to be real yeah. and not a co-option yeah. or an affectation. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it was, there was a time... You know, seven, eight years ago, a client would say, we want to be Apple. How can we be Apple? And now they say, we want to be Patagonia. How do we be that? And the, tr the fact is, some brands can, some brands can't. That brand's been like that yeah. since the late 70s. Um, and the other thing is there is, so first of all, you know, if you want to go cause related, stuff like that, only certain brands will have a right to play. In addition to that, you know, there is a bit of a misconception around purpose, as you're saying, mm. is not just about supporting causes. It could be about instilling pride. It could be about encouraging exploration. It's ultimately it's the meaning why you yeah. exist beyond yeah. just selling products. Yeah. I think we, we did a study where the top, <laughs> the top seven, I think, out of the top ten brands for under 30s were, were tech brands. And I think, to your point, those brands are utility. They're, they're the platform for, for you to express yourself. I think you look at Patagonia and they align with the values. So, you know, the, the, the brands that seem to be doing well are ones with a clear, clearly defined set of values that run through them like a stick of rock. And I, and I think that's different to um, our brand essence okay. and yeah. all, all of those kind of things. I, I think that is, that is the, that's the truth yeah. of, of a brand that, that is particularly at this moment matching the demographic that it's targeting rather than a really broad uh, set of values. But I think then, to, to your point, giving them a platform, giving, giving people the means to express themselves and the means to talk about their vulnerabilities or the means to educate themselves. I think the one thing we haven't really talked about here is, is um, if, if I'm forming my identity, I need your help to do that, right? And, th and there's a massive opportunity for brands to do that because school doesn't do it. Um, I don't think further education does it, does it enough. So if, if kids are going on YouTube to find out how to do things and they trust their a bloke who they've never met before to teach them more than, than the teacher who they've been had a relationship with for eight years, then we've got a bit of a problem and, and brands can play a part in, in that education process and in how they form their identity. And that's the way you will engender trust as a brand. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it feels like to, to play that kind of role, um, you almost need to de-business the brands to kind of take away that mechanical element of them um, and, and make them feel a bit more human. Uh, and and, and I, it feels like the, the way you've all been talking about it is, is that these brands are multifaceted. Uh, you know, it isn't just a, a, a kind of a creative ad campaign that launches and then you know airs for a few weeks and then disappears. It, it isn't always on idea, uh, which is expressed in so many different ways. I think I, I love. I'm really interested in this talk about identity formation, and I'm going to throw another grenade uh -huh. into the form, which is data and identity formation. I, I'm fascinated by the way in which data, visibly and invisibly, is today more than ever before mediating the identity forming moment of young people. I think that's really fascinating. I think we're only now beginning to understand what that might mean and where that might take this generation. I don't have an art, I, I just think it's a really interesting question. I was stroking my beard about it. I think it's a fascinating area. Another, another part of the, the selfhood study that, that Dom referenced, one of the other kind of chapters is, we, we called it defined by dopamine, and the, the dopamine rush that you get when you see your numbers from a post, the data, you know, the yeah. likes or the, the follows or the, the retweets or, or whatever it may be, um, that's the thing that's starting to define their identity, yeah. Yeah. is I'll do more of this and I'll do less of this. In fact, I'll ignore that that ever happened, I'll take it down. Yeah. I, think, I think where data comes really, really interesting, and actually I think it's a media plan of dream as well, because when you kind of look at identity, identity is multi-dimensional. 
and the same person can have many different kind of faces throughout one day. So I, I'm here, and I'm, or a young person's here, and they're kind of a young kind of creative. They get, the same day they get missold a phone, they pick up, speak to Vodafone, shout at them, they're a sovereign tough guy. They go ha home to the family and they kind of become the perfect son. They get, then get in a minicab and go to Ibiza, to Luton to go to Ibiza and they're the lad. So even in one day that identity can take multiple different forms and that's why I think data and media planning is coming more and more kind of central to understand that sense of identity and multi dimensional And I think as well, you know, we, we talk about them all being real and they want authenticity but, you know, when we look at for some of our brands, it's also about having fun. It's still the most watched show for 16 to 24 year olds, which is why we sponsored it this year, is Love Island, which is inherently false. It's inherently everything that, you know, the studies all say we don't want that sort of thing, but it's, it, it is really, that's still there, when you call it a guilty pleasure or where they go to have fun. They're not just these sort of super serious, we care about meaning people. Equally as a brand, you have to, give them the opportunity to have fun with your brands as well as have something that you can stand for and not sort of just see them as this sort of, and like you said, it's about that sort of hopes versus fears. They still want to have those hopeful times and those fun times at the same time um, as, as finding decent ways to engage with brands and with, with their peers. It's, it's such a great point, isn't it? Because I, mean, like, I, I think as an in industry, we're, we're often weighed down by this idea of purpose and of being value-centric at all times. Um, and, and you're right, there, there probably isn't enough fun <laughs> in, in the creative work we're doing. And I, 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 and I think you know, part of the job of advertising is to entertain and to cut through in that way. Um, and, and, it, and it's no surprise that you know, one of the biggest cultural threads of last year was, 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 was a piece of escapist you know, fantasy. But, it, but it's more than that. I mean, you've got to remember that this is Love Island take two. They had one go at Love Island. I think Abby Titmus snogged Lee Sharp and about seven <laughs> people were watching. So Love Island came again, and when it was refitted for the 21st century, it became not a broadcast brand, but a profoundly social brand. That is a broadcast built for social media. It is water cooler fodder for all generations and that's why it works and that trumps all of this nonsense frankly because people love to talk and connect and laugh and also i think where dreams become less achievable and there's a feeling that dreams can't be achieved then i think people move into this place of kind of fantasy so if you look at history anytime there's been a dark time or a recession people moved into kind of realm of fantasy you're seeing the kind of rise of kind of superhero kind of culture you're seeing Disney, you're seeing all these fancy elements kind of playing through. And I think that's a consequence of, I can't achieve my dreams, so let's go into something that's unachievable. Malibu did a great campaign this, uh, this year where they, they sent, I don't know, a, a dozen influencers to Vietnam and they stayed there for a week. And they, I think it was called the Malibu Games or something like that. And basically, all of these guys were doing great jobs capturing content, but the whole idea was just people having fun. It was a real escapism and it was... It was, it was like Love Island, uh, using influencers <laughs> on steroids. And I think that can be a value. You know, that, that brands don't have to stand for really, really deep, kind of heavy, meaningful stuff all of the time. I think if you just go, do you know what? We're, we're actually a brand that's all about bringing you fun and entertainment. There's real value in that as well. I think we, we talk in the agency a lot about positive creativity. And I think never has there been more of a need for positive creativity. It's basically the answer is slime videos. <laughs> That's how big, you know how big slime videos are. We work, I, I won't, won't name the name, but we were working with a, quite a young, a teen sensation pop star. And we were investigating popular YouTube channels with um, <laughs> number one was like slime video channel. <laughs> Mystery to me, but very popular. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Well, I, I, I think what we can tell is that there is no kind of silver bullet for this audience, right? There is no panacea of, of how to reach them or how to connect with them. Um, you know, it, it, it depends on who your brand is. And it depends on the kind of values that you can ascribe yourself to. Uh, and you need to be a kind of as human as possible as that and as, as kind of multidimensional as possible. Um, I, I, we're kind of running out of time a little bit, um, but I wanted to ask if there are any questions um, from the audience. Uh, based on anything that we've talked about today. Okay, yeah, one at the back. Uh, hi, uh, my name's Paul. Um, you spoke a lot about 
um, not telling people what to do, and the fact that um, brands are struggling to release control to this new generation, um, and they don't want to be controlled, they don't want to be told what to do. How do you consistently uh, maintain your brand identity in that space if you're releasing so much control to this generation? Anyone want to take that? I guess um, it is very difficult to, to kind of, we, we've restaged a lot of our brands in the last year to try and um, bring on board some, some young people who all like to think that they're very creative and they are and it's brilliant because actually if you don't keep reinventing your brands they will die you know we, we restaged CoverGirl which isn't a brand for here but they, it's the first time they've redone anything on their brand in 20 years and you know something as fundamental as changing the strap line was hugely unpopular with the older customer base but to restage it into something that that really resonated with that younger audience was not an easy thing to persuade marketing to do but you kind of go, you're in a, an ever-cluttered market. You've got people like the Kardashians, who ultimately aren't that realistic, but, um, but you've got people like Rihanna coming out with beauty brands that are genuinely diverse. You know, if you don't reinvent yourself, especially in this sort of space, you are just going to die. There's no such thing as a brand that's too big to fail. They can all go the way of the dodo very, very, very quickly. Um, and, and a lot of the brands, it's kind of going back and going, what do we actually stand for? Have we actually looked at it at any period of time and going, what the heck are we actually about? Rather than just going, oh yeah, we're easy breezy cover girl. Like, what does that even mean? You kind of go, okay, well, let's restage that into, you are what you make up. And sort of going, okay, you can be however you want to be. You can use makeup in any way or not use makeup. It's entirely your choice. But it's as a category, just going back and going, we don't want to use it in the way that we used to be and genuinely making sure that you keep on top of really looking at what your brand is, even if you don't change it, but just making sure you readdress it on a regular basis and you don't become tired and insular. Um, I would also say we're talking about an audience who have quite a fluid identity, so I'd, I'd tear apart your brand identity from being, you know, brand purity. Um, to give you an example, niche brand in fashion world, Balenciaga, long history, and we found with this audience, they care more about reputation than history. So very few of these, you know, 20 year old, you know, people lost in after a Balenciaga jacket, even though who Cristobal Balenciaga was, but in a reputation of the brand in context now. So the identity of that brand has shifted quite drastically, but it's the reputation of where it is right now. And to your point, that's always gonna fluctuate. So I think you're right, you can't give complete control, but it's about speaking to the audience, sorry, speaking with the audience, not at the audience. And I think that's where the audience starts to feel like this is, this is something, because you know, we've got, you've got people here who have multiple Snapchat uh, identities, you know, be into one thing one minute and the next, you know, you, you are still mirroring that fluidity, whether it be sexuality, social media, these guys are quite open to that fluidity. So. I think you can do that as long as you know, as long as you're not being, you know, overly uh, death grip on your brand purity. I think you can maintain your identity while still moving. And and I think be brave, stand for something. And I think that's one of the most important things. Nike recently, I think it was NBC. They had, they had an American football player who's Afro Caribbean who who knelt for Black Lives Matters when the, the anthem was playing. They put him on their ads. Their share price price drops massively but it'll be a long term success because they're being brave ok <laughs> I think we're out of time <laughs> ok cool um, look, guys thank you very much for your effort um, a really uh, rich and textured debate around youth audiences so thank you very much thank you. thanks very much guys guys and girls Thank you.